There are times when you sit down to focus on the breath, and the mind is right there. And it takes to the breath. And John Fuhring would use the phrase that the mind takes to the breath in the same way a kite takes to the wind. You spread your awareness to the body, and it stays there. And you get interested in how the breath energy is moving, how you can fix the problems with the breath energy here and there. You get absorbed in the whole process of being with the body, immersed in the body, immersed in the breath. There are other times, though, when it's like putting a beach ball down into the water. You put it down in, and it pops right out. The mind wants to, or seems to want to think about anything about the breath. And here it's useful to remember how the Buddha taught his son breath meditation. Rahula asked him one time, how do you practice mindfulness of breathing? And the Buddha didn't start right in with this, the 16 steps of breath meditation. Instead, he taught Rahula a lot of other meditation topics first. And the first one is one where he says, make your mind like earth. Whatever gets thrown in the earth, the earth doesn't respond, doesn't react, doesn't get disgusted. Make your mind like water. People use water to wash away disgusting things, but the water itself isn't disgusted. Make it like fire. Fire burns disgusting things. Make it like wind. Wind blows disgusting things around, but neither of them gets upset by the fact that these things are disgusting. Basically what he's saying here is develop some patience, develop some equanimity. The mind is thinking, okay, it's thinking this is where you are. This is acceptance without resignation. In other words, you accept the situation as it is, but you don't resign yourself to it, because the Buddha doesn't stop with just being equanimous. It gives you alternative ways of thinking about the topics. In other words, if the mind is not willing to settle down with the breath, have it think. It's got the energy to think. And the thinking usually comes from irritation of some kind or another. This is why he starts with that image of not letting yourself get irritated by things. Because first you're irritated with things outside, then you start getting irritated with yourself for not being able to settle down, and then things just go into a downward spiral. Instead, you have some patience. Okay, this is going to take some time. But you don't just sit there with whatever's coming up. The Buddha gives you alternative ways of thinking about it, like the Sutta we chanted just now, thinking about things in terms of being not self. These thoughts are not yours. You don't have to take them on. All too often a thought gets proposed to the committee in the mind. And just the fact that it's been proposed makes you think, well, everybody's got to go along. Well, no. Somebody may be proposing the idea, but you don't have to go along with it. You see it as something separate, which is what the teaching on not self is all about. And as the Buddha said, to really get beyond your attachments to things, you have to see them as separate. There's your awareness, but the thought is something else. You think about how things are inconstant. The thoughts come and they're going to go. The good things will come and they'll go. So when the good things come, you don't take advantage of them. When the bad things are here, you just wait till they go. Or if you want to move them along a little bit faster, and the Buddha recommends thinking about the topics of goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity, whichever topic is appropriate for the problem you've got right now. Or to contemplate the body in terms of the 32 parts. Whichever issue you are, whichever type of issue that you're concerned with, there's a way of thinking that can counteract it. So if you don't want to stay with the breath, or you want to stay with the breath, but some parts of your mind don't want to stay with the breath, and start thinking about those issues. You've got the energy to think, okay, think, but think the way the Buddha would think, or how he, how he would recommend that you think. Ask yourself, what would the Buddha recommend? WWBR. -W 
you're thinking about yesterday. Well, what would he recommend about your thoughts about yesterday? You're thinking about tomorrow. You're thinking about something that somebody did, often it'd be a long time ago. What would the Buddha recommend? What would be the antidote to that kind of thinking? Well, use that kind of thinking to counteract the way the mind is churning away with the topic. Until you're ready to settle down. You've decided you've had enough of that topic. The mind may think up another topic. Well, think up the antidote for that. What would the Buddha recommend for that? In this way, you develop equanimity, but you don't just stay there. There's the acceptance that, okay, this is what the mind is doing right now. The part of you that wants to get as much out of the time you have at the monastery and gets impatient. Okay, you've got to rein in that impatience a bit. So look, this is where you are. This is where you start. And where do you go from here? You see this same teaching in the Forest of John's when John Lee is talking about the different ways of meditating. In his book, Frames of Reference, he starts out with different ways of thinking. Think about the 32 parts of the body. Think about the body in terms of the elements. Think about how inconstant things are. To develop a sense of sangwega, it's this sangwega that helps pull you away from your concerns. Think about how you might be on your deathbed someday and looking back. And What were you thinking about when you were on your meditation retreat? Well, you were thinking about a grocery list. Or you're thinking about a revenge list. You'd say, what a waste of time. Well, try to develop that attitude toward these things. They may seem real and very important in the mind right now. You're getting into a state of becoming, and when you're in that state of becoming, the world looks very different from what it does when you're out of that state of becoming. It's like waking up from a dream and realizing, oh, it was just a dream. While you're in it, you're all concerned. You're at an airport and you can't get to the gate. You look for your luggage and the luggage isn't there. And then you say, hey, this is a dream. Then the luggage doesn't matter anymore because it's luggage in a dream. It's not the real thing. But learn to look at your thoughts in just the same way. And try whatever antidote the Buddha recommends, whether it's the Brahma Viharas or the contemplation of the body, contemplation of death. Contemplation of not self, inconstancy, all of which we tend to equate with the wisdom part of the practice that should come after the concentration, but that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes it requires some wisdom to get the mind to settle down. This is why the Buddha said that to get the mind into jhana requires both tranquility and vipassana, or insight. Because sometimes you need to understand your mind, and you need to learn how to parry with the mind. In other words, it's thrusting in one way, you parry its thrust. It's like learning a martial art, where you use the opponent's strengths against him. Your mind is thinking, thinking, thinking. Okay, use that thinking against the kind of thinking that's pulling you away from the, the meditation. Turn it around. And John Mahabur calls this discernment fostering concentration. He wrote a whole book on the topic. Sometimes things don't go right in the line with which they're listed in the text. So it's saying, well, first there's virtue, and then there's concentration, and then there's discernment. He says, your defilements don't stand in a neat line. It's not the case that you deal first with sensual desire, and then with ill will, and then with torpor and lethargy, and then with restlessness, and then with uncertainty. They can come in any order at all. So you have to be prepared. Okay. Whatever is coming up in the mind, you deal with that first. And if the mind is feeling obstreperous and entangled with things, the Jamahabua's images of a tree in the middle of a forest. 
which is unlike a tree out in the meadow. If the tree is in the meadow and you want to cut it down, you don't have to think too much about which direction you're going to fell the tree. You can cut it from any direction at all. But if it's in the forest, you find well, its branches are entangled with the branches of the other trees. So you've got to, first you've got to cut the branches. Then you have to figure out which direction the tree is going to fall. To get it to fall between the other trees and not on top of them. And then you can use it. In this case, the branches stand for all your thoughts running out in all directions. So you use your discernment to cut, cut, cut through them. And which one do you cut first? Well, as Lumbudun explained to the king of Thailand one time, and the king asked him which defilement should be cut first. Lumbudun said, whichever one arises first. In other words, whatever is coming up in your mind right now, that's the one you've got to deal with. And whether it's a defilement that you feel primed to deal with and say, gee, this is one that I really want to work on, or not. This is where that practice of making the mind like earth comes in. Okay, This is the one you've got to deal with right now. This is what you deal with. And you learn not to make too big a deal out of it. After a while, you get used to it. And when it comes up, anger comes up, you can cut right through it. Greed follows. You cut right through that. Lust follows. Cut right through that. More greed. I'll cut through that one again. Then it becomes your sport. And when nothing is coming up, okay, now you can settle down and be with the breath. Give the mind the rest it deserves. Because often we feel that, well, there are all these other things I have to take care of. First, I have all these other responsibilities. It's kind of selfish to just be here with the breath. It's not selfish at all. That's what the mind needs. It needs a place of rest in order to see things clearly and act clearly and make clear decisions. When your mind is functioning well, everybody around you benefits. So remind yourself, this is something that's good for everybody. So there's no question of you're not deserving the stillness or not deserving the ease or bliss or whatever that can come when the mind settles down. This is for the good of all. So when you look at your state of mind and see anything that's getting in the way of your concentration, ask yourself, okay, what would the Buddha recommend? WWBR. And you find that over time you get more and more instinctive sense of what he would actually say. and become more and more inclined to actually follow his advice.